Good morning. What are we going to talk about today? Love. That's a great thing. You were really listening to that song, weren't you? What's your favorite thing about love? Uh, Come up here and you can talk. Red. Okay. Anybody else have a thought on love? Have, having a turkey for dinner. Really? <laughs> um, hugs. Friends and family. Friends and family. Kisses. Kisses. Um, love. Love. Hugs. Hugs. They're very important. Hearts. Hearts. Hearts, Hearts are great. How about hugs? Do you all like hugs? I like hugs. Okay. What happened to you, my dear? What happened to your nose? I fall down at school. Ooh, did somebody come over and help you? That was love, wasn't it? How about all the people here? Do you know any of the people in here that you really, really, really love? My grandpa, who served in the war. Fantastic. So he was a veteran. Friends and family. Friends and family. Brody. Everyone here and my mom. Everyone here and, and your mom. Well, that's great. Caden. I love my mom. You love your mom. Oh, that's great. I think we all had or have parents that we really, really love. But there's somebody really special that we should love every single day. Who would that be? God. Good. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Any other names that you know for him? Very good. You know quite a bit about that. How about the Lamb of God? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Morning Light? Yeah. Okay. You guys are super. I really like the fact that you helped me today because I didn't have a clue what I was going to do up here. Pardon me? Okay. How about if we all say a prayer right now, okay? Dear God, thank you for bringing these children up here and for letting them share the things that they know about love and for uh, to us to let them know that we love them and we love God very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody. One of the joys that we do have again this morning, uh, we haven't had for quite some time, uh, special music by Georgette Weevil is going to uh, sing to us this morning called Temporary Home. Did I get that right? Okay. <laughs> I haven't done this for a long time, so bear with me. Little boy, six years old A little too used to being alone Another new mom and dad Another school, another house That'll never be home When people ask him how he likes this place and says with a smile upon his face This is my temporary home It's not where I belong Windows and rooms that I'm passing through This is just a stop on the way to where I'm going And I'm not afraid because I know This is my temporary home
young mom on her own. She needs a little help, got nowhere to go. She's looking for a job, looking for a way out. Cause a halfway house will never be home. At night, she whispers to her baby girl. Someday we'll find a place here in this world. This is our temporary home. It's not where we belong. Windows and rooms, we're passing through. This is just a stop on the way to where we're going. And I'm not afraid because I know Temporary home Old man, hospital bed the room is filled with people he loves And he whispers, don't cry for me I'll see you all someday He looks up and says I can't see God's face This was my temporary home It's not where I belong Windows and rooms We're passing through This is just a stop On the way to where I'm going I'm not afraid Because I know This was my temporary home is our temporary home Thanks Georgia From the elder to the chosen gentlewoman and her children, whom I truly love, and I am not the only one, because all who know the truth, because of the truth that remains with us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, will be ours who live in truth and love. I was overjoyed to find some of your children living in the truth, just as we had been commanded by the Father. Now, dear friends, I am requesting that we love each other. It's not as though I'm writing a new command to you, but it's one we have had from the beginning. This is love, that we live according to his commands. This is the command that you heard from the beginning. Live in love. Many deceivers have gone into the world who do not confess that Jesus Christ came as a human being. This kind of person is deceiver and the Antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you don't lose what we've worked for, but instead receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not continue in the teaching about Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in this teaching has both the Father and the Son. Whoever comes to you who does not affirm this teaching should neither be received nor welcomed into your home, because welcoming people like that is the same as sharing in their evil actions. I have a lot to tell you. I don't want to use paper and ink, but I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy can be complete. Your chosen sister's children greet you. 
So ends the reading of God's holy word. Thank you, Bonnie. Well, uh, today we continue with um, what we've identified as the uh, lesser known books or letters uh, found in the New Testament. Uh, in Mike's case, however, it's the completely unknown books of the New Testament that <laughs> we are looking at today. But we're looking at um, today 2 John or 2 John. Next week we're going to be looking at 3 John or 3 John. Uh, we're skipping 1 John, but um, 1 John and 2 John and 3 John uh, were written by someone that uh, goes by the name of Anonymous. So we are not certain whether or not it uh, was written by the, uh, uh, the Gospel of John or according to um, the um, Epistle of John or the uh, Apostle John. Uh, but it is widely believed that that is in fact who wrote uh, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Which is really interesting because if you remember when we did the Gospel of John as a sermon series, we focused on the fact that that particular author focused 100% of his writings on the divinity of Christ. Always focusing on the miracles that Christ performs. And as you can tell from what uh, Bonnie read this morning, this particular John is referring to the human side of Christ, that he actually was here in flesh and blood as the Son of God. And so it's, it's fascinating if it was in fact the same John that wrote these uh, lesser known books uh, referring to the human side of uh, Jesus Christ. So, a man walks into a bar. It's kind of dark in there and he notices as he goes in that the bartender is clear at the other end of the bar out of earshot. No one else is in the bar. It's kind of dark. And all of a sudden, he hears a voice. And that voice says, Wow, look at you today. You're really looking good. I have never seen such a good-looking suit on anybody. He goes, Whoa, that's kind of nice. But he looks around. He can't see anybody else in the bar except the bartender who's way at the end of the bar. So he's walking around a little bit more, and all of a sudden he hears another voice. And this one says, wow, look at that haircut, Don. You must have gone to Connie Bussy, because you're looking good. Well, this guy's looking around. He cannot figure out where this is coming from. So finally he goes on a little bit further, and then all of a sudden this voice comes out of the, uh, out of the darkness again and says, Holy cats, look at those shoes. They are the shiniest shoes I have ever seen on anybody. You are one good-looking dude today. This guy's feeling pretty good, but he doesn't have any idea where this voice is coming from. So he shouts at the bartender who's at the end of the bar and says, Hey, what, what's going on here? Where's that voice coming from? And the bartender says, Oh, don't worry about that. That's the peanuts in the bowl. They're complimentary. So we hear all kinds of voices, don't we? We hear all kinds of voices out there. Some are complimentary, but most often they are not complimentary. Oftentimes they're critical. Oftentimes they're picky. They nag at us sometimes. They're, in my case, it's my mother, you know, from many years ago. Notice I didn't say <laughs> anybody else. It's, Smart guy, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I want supper tonight. <laughs> but oftentimes that voice that we hear is critical, and it nags at us. But we have to be aware sometimes that what we hear, these voices that we hear every day from people that are in the present or people that are from our past or even from ourselves in the present or ourselves in the past. You know, we're our worst critics sometimes. We have to be able to decide whether or not what we're hearing is truth or not. 
And that's what John is talking about today when he talks about living in the truth. We need to be able to determine whether or not what we hear every day, regardless of the source, whether or not it's the truth. And what does John tell us to do? He says, come up with a way to test the spirits. Come up with a way to discern whether or not what you're hearing is the truth. And his method of testing for the truth that he talks about is to say that if people speak of the fact that Christ was God's son and came here in the flesh, then they speak the truth. If people are saying just the opposite of that, that he didn't come here, that he wasn't doing the things that he had done, then they are not speaking the truth. We kind of have our own built-in lie detector that we can use to discern whether or not what we hear from other people and from ourselves is the truth or not. Now that's just one aspect, whether or not what they're saying about what we believe in and the sovereignty of God and, and Christianity as a whole. It's quite simple. I mean, we just simply listen for those things to determine whether or not it's the truth. But what about those voices that are there saying, we're no good. You know, you never could do anything right. What about those voices? How do we know if that's the truth or not? Simply look at the fact whether or not, does God want you to believe that you're no good? Does God want you to believe that you'll never amount to anything? Use the same testing of the spirits to determine whether or not what you're hearing is truth or not. It's quite simple. Just, just do it. Just put it together. The other thing that we learn about is love and whether or not how we live in love and what is love. Can you imagine, can you imagine somebody from outer space coming down here and saying, yeah, this English language, I really understand it. At one time someone says, you know, I love my wife. And then the other time they say, I love a cheeseburger. Yeah, if you're from outer space, you're going to, what is going on here? How can you love two things like that, two different ways? It's probably one of the most misused and misunderstood words that we have in our language today. Yet God calls us to live in love. God calls us to love Him with all of our mind and our soul and our strength and our might. And he also calls us to love one another. And that's what John is telling us to do in the book of 2 John. Live in love and live in truth. When God says that we need to live in this truth and we need to live in this love, he's asking that we become indwelled, we become filled with him, become where Christ is within us where the Holy Spirit fills us, indwells us, and dominates our lives. Do you know that Christianity is the only religion on the planet that talks about the indwelling of God? The Buddha does not live in the Buddhist. Muhammad does not live inside of the Islamist. But God lives inside of us because we are to become Christ-like. We are to become godlike in how we love and how we live in the truth and how we treat one another. It's the only religion on the planet today that indwells that. If we look at some of the things that Paul wrote about in the New Testament, he's talking about uh, in Corinthians, for example, we have a choice. We can either, and I love these choice of words, we can either live in the uh, foolishness of the Gospels or we can choose to live in the confusing, contradictory cultures of the world today. He talks about being in the world or of the world. And of course, being in the world is not the same as being of the world. Being of the world is living in love and living in truth. Whereas being in the world is dealing with all the materialistic things that we have and all the, the contradictions that we have going on in our lives today. When we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives, 
God is within us. God is guiding our every action. God is seeing to it that we, with his help, are being who he wants us to be. And when that happens, he owns us. He has taken over our lives for us. And that's where we want to be. That's where we need to be. When I was in high school, I had the um, unfortunate assignment, I forget if it was my senior year or what, of reading a very large book, a novel, that many of you, I'm sure, have heard about. It's called Les Miserables, or The Miserables. Remember that? In fact, it was a recently a, a movie that came out. Now, did anybody see the movie, Les Miserables? A few people. It's a musical! <laughs> <laughs> Why would you go to a movie that's a musical? <laughs> it's a musical. But it's a beautiful, beautiful story, as I recall. Now, back then, we didn't have cliff notes. I, I probably would have done that or gone to the Internet and gotten a, a quick plot uh, summary when I had to do the book report. But I hated reading back then. It was just terrible to read this French novel called Les Miserables. Or, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it correctly. But Briefly, the plot is that this main character, this ex-convict, uh, Jean Valjean, or something to that effect, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, or don't, <laughs> gets out of jail after spending 19 years in prison, and he's a convict, so he's, he has no way of supporting himself. He goes from house to house trying to find shelter, trying to find food, knocks on the door. Everybody that answers the door slams the door in his face and turns him away. Nobody lets him in until one time he's there at the home of a bishop. And the bishop says, yes, come on in, come on in. And the bishop welcomes him into the house. And it's around supper time, so the bishop feeds him a very warm and large meal. And the bishop serves the meal to this guy on uh, basically the, the bishop's only <laughs> possession that he has, and that's a silver tray and maybe a silver bowl and uh, a silver serving spoon of some kind. And so he, the bishop is telling this, uh, uh, this ex-convict about um, the fact that this is all he owns. And so they finish the meal and uh, uh, they go to retire, and um, instead of going to bed, the convict sneaks back downstairs and steals all the silver, or most of the silver that the bishop owned. And then he runs outside the house. Well, the next thing he knows, there's a, a whole police force in, uh, in France. And by the way, this takes place in the early eight, uh, 19th century, uh, early 1800s, uh, right before the uh, revolution of some kind in 1835. So the police are after this, uh, this ex-convict, and he's got all the silver, and they catch him. And they bring him back to the bishop, and the bishop has a moment of grace. And the bishop says, oh, there you are. You didn't get everything. You forgot the silverware. You forgot the spoons and the forks. And, all. and he gives them to the guy. And so the police are going, well, what's going on here? Obviously, this guy didn't steal these things. So they turn him back over to the care of the bishop. Now, the main character, Jean Valjean, is just blown away by the grace given to him by the bishop. And that's exactly the kind of grace that God gives us. Let me tell you something. There's nothing you can do that will shock God. There's nothing you can do that will cause him to say, Jeff, I didn't know you were going to do that. If I'd have known that, I wouldn't have saved you. Nothing. Nothing. He knows it long before you've done it. God's grace is there ahead of time. And so the, the miserables, the les miserables, is a way of describing and, and defining this grace that God has for us. And the bishop then tells Jean Valjean, I own you now. You're mine. But he didn't mean that in a slave sense or in any kind of a negative sense. He meant that because I've given and shown you grace. You are to do the same with people that you meet, with people that come into your life. And again, that's exactly what God is asking of us. God is giving us grace and forgiveness and mercy 
and ask us to do the same, to live in truth and to live in love. John puts it very simply. Two simple things, truth and love. It's beautiful. And what a crazy, topsy-turvy thing that we have here when we look at this kind of a God. It's the kind of God that says, I love you just as you are, but I love you so much that I don't want to leave you there. I love you just as you are, but I'm not going to leave you there. God will save us from anything that can happen except one thing. There's only one thing that God will not save us from, and that's ourselves. He won't jump in the way. We break covenants with him all the time. He won't jump in there and prevent us or save us from ourselves. We do that to ourselves. But once again, keep in mind and don't lose sight of the fact there's nothing you can do that will shock him. Ever. He knows. What a topsy-turvy thing we have. You want greatness? Bend low and wash the feet of others. You want everything? Give everything away. Love your enemies. There's no darkness of death anywhere that can overshadow anything. Overshadow the resurrection of Christ in our lives. Truth and love. Simple two words. Amen.